it's good to come around the word of the Lord. Um, I'll just join my prayer to yours. Heavenly Father, do thank you for this opportunity to read and to preach from the word of God. Father, I just pray that you would take these words uh, by your Spirit's power, that you would apply them to each person's heart and mind. Lord, that they would uh, uh, reveal what it is that you wish to say to the people this morning. I pray that you would help me, Lord, to, to really uh, rely upon your Spirit and to, if necessary, change the direction of my sermon this morning. Lord, I pray that all things might be done uh, to the glory of God and that Jesus Christ might be enthroned in our midst and glorified and exalted, Lord. Help us to understand your word, the Bible, in Jesus' name. Well, um, if this, this is your first time this morning, you're, you're coming in at the end of three sermons. This is the third in a series of three sermons that I've been preaching about uh, the book of Leviticus, uh, and I call it uh, Decoding Leviticus. I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit Dan Brown, isn't it? But, but there you go. You go. That was the title I picked, and and we've looked at over the last few weeks. Just the, the way that the book of Leviticus speaks in, in a way that, you know, on the surface level, uh, uh, it might be perhaps one of the most confusing books in the Bible. When you start to read through it, you think, well, well what's the relevance of all this? But it, God is speaking through these uh, rituals, these offerings, these observances that we read about. So that's really what I was getting at, was there is a deeper meaning in this book. Uh, that, that's relevant for us today as Christians. And uh, if you recall uh, uh, back, the first sermon that I preached was on the burnt offerings, on the sacrifices, and we talked about how it represented Christ offering himself on the cross for us, but also it represented that we are called to lay ourselves on the altar, uh, that we are called to lay our flesh on that altar, to deny ourselves and to take up our cross, and, and we looked at some of the uh, sort of strange things that were used in the ceremonies where they would take out the inside of the animal and wash them, uh, and then burn the animal, and we talked about how it, it signified that cleansing, that sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life, that, that he is the only one who can cleanse us, uh, uh, not just externally, but internally as well. And so that was the first time we looked at the second one. We looked at some of the more unusual commandments, uh, you know, uh, not, not mixing wool and linen together, not putting uh, two different types of seed in the same field and so on. So we talked a bit about that, uh, how it was a reference to uh, Christians separating themselves from the world, uh, remaining separate, and uh, uh, really that it was to do with holiness at the end of it. Remember we got to the end of Leviticus 24 uh, and, and, and it was talking about just separating yourself, being holy unto the Lord. And so whilst uh, uh, some of these things may seem odd, a little bit strange to us, when we, when we look at the deeper meaning, we talked about how to interpret the Bible, um, not through you know, uh, or our own personal ideas, not, not putting an idea or an interpretation on the scriptures, but rather allowing the scriptures to interpret one another and how we, we were looking for uh, the New Testament to really inform our understanding of the Old Testament and that, that our theology really at heart should be Christocentric, should have Christ uh, and his church in view. And so I hope that I have communicated that to you and we're going to go on in the same manner um, this morning. So if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to follow me. I'm going to be reading from Leviticus chapter 25 and starting at verse 8. Verse 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee Forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. 
and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you, ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you, and you shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. Okay, let's just, uh, just stop there for a moment. So, the year of jubilee is what we're going to be, I'm going to be preaching about uh, this morning, and um, this is the last in the series, and um, it's important that we see, I think, the relevance to us as Christians. Um, what, what is the significance? Well, let's first of all uh, explain a little bit more about what the year of Jubilee was. So it comes at the end of um, uh, seven cycles of years. Uh, so if you like, seven times seven, 49. And then in the, you're impressed there, weren't you? And then in the, the 50th year of the Day of Atonement, they would sound, the, well, the trumpet it says here, I guess it would be like the ram's horn, that, woo, sound, that sound would come. And you know, this is, uh, this is the Jubilee. This is, now, now with the Sabbath years themselves, you're thinking of the Sabbath during the week. Yeah, it's a day of rest. Well, the Sabbath year uh, uh, would really be a, a year of rest. Now, now, why? Why do they have a year of rest? Well, I think there's a number of reasons uh, why they have that. Um, firstly, to remind the Jews that actually they don't own the land. They are tenants in the land. God is the one who owns the land. Isn't that right? Yeah? The whole earth is the Lord's. Yeah? And, 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 and the cattle on a thousand hills. The Lord owns the land. So here's a reminder. He's the landowner. And he says, it's the Sabbath year. So, so it, it, it just reminds them that God is the one who, who owns the land. Secondly, it's to test their obedience. Are you going to do this? Are you, are you going to be obedient to God? Uh, thirdly, it is to, uh, uh, to demonstrate that God is able to sustain his people. He is well able to look after them. Uh, you know, these are, these are, whilst these are practical observances, there's a supernatural element to them. You know, God, God is getting them to think about who he is and what part he plays in their lives. There's something about human beings, isn't it? That we become, uh, we're very much drawn to self-sufficiency. We think we can do it. If we try really, really hard, we could probably live uh, the Christian life. We could probably please God. And here's a reminder. No, you are reliant upon me. Jesus himself says, doesn't he? Without me, you can do nothing. So here's a reminder of it. Okay? Uh, uh, Fourthly, it is to prevent them from trusting in their works uh, and thinking, well, you know, we, we worked really hard this year and we've got all this food and this grain stored up so we can, you know, that, that's okay, we can look after ourselves, we've got this sort of, this shelter arranged for us, you know, if anything goes wrong, we've saved up for a rainy day and, uh, you know, no, this is a time where you learn to trust on the Lord and it's to remind them, I believe, as well, that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a time where uh, those who follow the Lord will enter into the rest that he's promised. I think uh, Richard Baxter, the, the Puritan, uh, uh, famous Puritan writer and pastor, uh, called it the saint's rest. There, there is a, a, a time where you and I will enter into heaven uh, if, you, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, you'll enter into the rest that God has prepared for you. So you can see that the, the, the year of Jubilee is really quite a, um, 
radical idea, really, quite a revolutionary um, idea. Um, the, the, that, that, that's the Sabbath, but, but what we have in the, the, the year of Jubilee is a time of sorting out, a time where uh, uh, past things that have gone on, past deals uh, would, be, would be really sorted out and, and, and what we get is slaves will be, and prisoners will be set free, uh, debts will be forgiven and land will be returned because I mean there's, there's no welfare system at this time. You know, if you're struggling and you're a Hebrew, uh, you could actually voluntarily sell yourself and your family into service, if you like. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and that would be a way you could, you could look after yourself. And when the year of Jubilee comes on, what, what the Lord is saying is, uh, uh, they must go free now. Set those servants free now. Uh, if there's any debts outstanding, you know, that's it, it's cleared. Yeah, because this is a time of liberty. This is a time of freedom. And on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, uh, the, the, that, that horn would sound and it would, it would signify this year of Jubilee. Perhaps it's significant as well that, you know, um, uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, he says, in chapter 58, verse 1, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. It just said, when I hear that, it reminds me of, this, of the year of Jubilee, the sounding of that, that trumpet sound. And, 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 and God is saying through Isaiah, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Make a proclamation like they did. They would start all the feasts like that, by the way. The sound of the trumpet, this is a feast of God. But it's signifying something of, of great importance. The question is, that, that's great. That was for the Jews, that was in their land, that's what happened. But what about us today? What do I get from the book of Leviticus? How do I understand uh, uh, what has been said here? Well, uh, I'd like you to turn to the New Testament, to Luke, Gospel of Luke. And chapter 4. And just to sort of set the scene, um, we're looking here at the Lord Jesus, uh, and he's, he's gone to, to the synagogue in Nazareth, and what the Jews would do is they would, uh, uh, on the Sabbath day, they would have uh, seven readers, not, not preachers, but readers. Okay, the seven, again, a significant number in the scriptures, I'm sure many of you will know that. The first reader would be a priest, the second reader would be a Levite, and then there would be five other men from the congregation who would get up and, and, and they'd be given a scripture to read, like we do with Matthew uh, this morning, they'd be given a scripture and they would, they would take it up and they would read it. And so what we see now when the Lord Jesus comes into this scenario, he is given a scripture, uh, and not from Leviticus, but, but it's from Isaiah. But I believe it is talking about the same thing that we're, we're concerned with this morning. So I'll put it up here on the, um, on the PowerPoint and you can, you can read that with me. Um, so, verse 18 is where it starts there. When you see verse 18 and verse 19. And, and Jesus read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What's the acceptable year of the Lord? It's the year of Jubilee. Verse 20. Here in Luke. Jesus says, it says, and he closed the book and he gave it to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. 
Wow, I'd love to have been there <laughs> just to see the reaction. <clears throat> but that's the providence of God, isn't it? Here's the scripture that the Holy Spirit has brought, uh, 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 has impressed upon the man's mind who gave him the scripture. You give him this to read. And this is the start of this incredible uh, earthly ministry that Jesus Christ has. Now the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Not, not, not in any small measure, uh, but, but in a way, you know, it, it says in John 3 verse 34, God giveth uh, not the Spirit by measure unto him. In other words, it's without measure. Uh, it's such a power, such a, uh, an anointing of the Spirit of God uh, that no prophet had had before Jesus Christ. Christ receives uh, the Spirit without measure. He, and He alone, is anointed for this unique task to reconcile mankind to God through the blood of His cross. And I want you to get, bear in mind all the time uh, what we read about the year of Jubilee, that cancelling of the debts, uh, that time of liberty, that time of freedom, uh, that time of release from slavery and from bondage. Remember when we look through the book of Liberty, because we've said this all along, that there is a spiritual application to these things. You know, they, they were shadows, they were types, they were not an end in themselves. You know, God was not concerned with uh, uh, how you cut up an animal and put it on the altar, or, or what kind of fabrics you were wearing. These were just shadows of something else. They were not an end in themselves. Christ is the end. He is the fulfillment of these things. He is the fulfillment of all this book. And so, so it is, we need to consider the year of Jubilee, we must consider it in the light of Christ as the fulfillment uh, of, of, of all of this. He came, first of all, to heal the broken hearted. Literally, those who are crushed those who are broken find healing in Christ. He is the great physician, isn't he? And he will heal those who are broken, who, who are disturbed, who, who, who are in turmoil. We had a young man this morning came in here who, who walked from Old Trafford in a t-shirt, just walking, and I said to him, where are you heading for? He said, I don't know. You know I mean? Now for him that's literal, but it's metaphorical in a lot of people's lives as well, isn't it? They are wandering through life, they're cold, they're lonely, uh, they're broken, they don't know where they're going. But they need to come to Jesus Christ and find rest and warmth and comfort as it were. You know, because he is the one who will heal their brokenness. He is the one who can heal that crushed heart those hurts and all the rest of it, whatever the problem is, they can find that, that, that healing of soul. He says, come to me, you will find rest for your soul. Your soul is disturbed, then why aren't you coming to Christ this morning? Because it's only He who has that answer. Psalm 147 verse 3 says, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. I like that. Reminds me of uh, uh, the Good Samaritan, isn't it? You know, lying there, broken, wounded. And here comes a person who comes, bandages up the wounds, looks after you, gives you time to heal. Uh, and, and that's what Christ does with us. He, he, he gives us so much more as well. A peace that passes all understanding. Uh, joy unspeakable. These are the gifts that Christ brings. These are the riches that are in Christ. But he comes to heal the broken hearted. There are promises of God that are fulfilled in Christ. But many people just sit staring at the wounds. Unfortunately. Will, will, you, will you sit looking at the wounds or will you come to him who can heal you? Nobody else can do it. Only, only Christ has, is anointed for that purpose. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him to do that which he was sent to do, which is to heal the broken hearted. The second thing is to preach deliverance to the captives. Remember in Leviticus, in the year of Jubilee, the slaves, the servants went free. But the Bible says, you know, there's, there's more than one kind of slavery. John 8, the, uh, yes, the Bible says, he who commits sin is the servant of sin. In other words, you are, you are its slave. You, if you commit sin and you allow it in your life, it will become your master and you will become its slave. And that's the relationship, isn't it? And the more you commit that particular sin, the more it becomes a besetting sin, the more you make room for it in your life. I'm talking deliberately making room for it. It will become your master. It will, it will become a stronghold, uh, uh, to quote uh, to Corinthians 10. It becomes a stronghold in your life. Uh, the devil uses that uh, to control that area of your life, maybe a particular thing that you do, and, and, and you're able to resist uh, until it becomes this one particular sin, that, that, that darling sin, uh, to use uh, Drysdale's phrase. And, and it just seems to, every time I, it comes along with a particular sin, I fall. Well, there is deliverance for you. There is deliverance through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came that you might have life. He says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. These are the promises that God gives in his word. Free indeed. Are you free? This morning, has he set you free? Do you know that freedom? Do you know the truth? If you don't know the truth, then you are not free. Now, you may be free to do what you want. That's not the same thing. What God is promising through Jesus Christ is a liberty that, that goes beyond anything uh, uh, that the world can offer. To be truly free is we are set free to serve Christ. That might sound like a paradox, but it isn't. Because uh, his yoke is light. We are, we are called into his service, and there is freedom in that service. If, if you reject Christ, if you don't walk according to the Spirit, you are walking according to the flesh, and you will come under uh, uh, a great burden. You know, I, I remember it, it talks about in the Old Testament when. Uh, uh, they, 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 they wanted to throw off the yokes uh, and, and, and God said to them, you, you will have a yoke of iron now. You throw off that yoke, you will have a yoke of iron. And if you throw off Christ's yoke, that light yoke, you will have a yoke of iron. You will have a burden and a weight of sin and of your flesh. And it will be, it, it, it will grind you into the ground, you know. Come to the one who can set you free. Come to the one who makes the captives free. Who the Spirit of the Lord has anointed for that purpose. For that purpose to make you free. In Him. There's a hymn that we sing here. Um, well known Charles Wesley hymn. And one of the verses in it goes. My chains fell off. My heart was Free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The picture is of a cell, of a dungeon, and uh, uh, if you remember in the hymn, light fills the dungeon, uh, uh, diffused from God himself, and, and the chains fall off, the person's heart is free. But it doesn't end there. It says, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. See, the problem is, in a lot of Christians' lives, the cell door opens, but they don't get up and follow him. 
they, they, they sit there and it's like they're picking the chains up and say, oh, terrible problems I've got here. And you know, when is God going to do something about, about my bondage? And, and, and well, he has done something about it. The cell door is open, but now you must arise. You must follow him. Now that involves sacrifice, doesn't it? That involves uh, uh, denying yourself, taking up our cross. A cross is that which is injurious to you. That which, you know, even Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He said, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but thine. That's the Christian life. We must come to the point of saying, yes, Lord, it's hard, it's difficult. But not my will, but mine. Because I have put my life on the altar. I have put who I am on that cross to God. doesn't concern anybody else and what they think. Or I'm not trying to fit in with anybody or become part of some kind of organisation. I'm not trying to impress anybody between me and God. But I have put who I am, my soul, on the altar for God. And now I am rising up. I am following him. If you have experienced new birth this morning, you have experienced the liberty that is found in Christ, then you must follow him. You cannot stay where you are. Get up, make haste, don't delay. You know, it's it's a beautiful sunny day outside that cell. <laughs> Don't stay in the darkness and the gloom. Get up and go and follow him. The other thing that Jesus mentions there is recovery of sight to the blind. Now, when Jesus was on earth, of course, he healed many blind people, didn't he? Uh, uh, and they were very thankful for that healing. And, uh, and I'm not saying that Jesus doesn't heal people today uh, in, in, in a physical way. And I've even experienced that this, this, this week. I've actually seen a physical healing this week. Amazing. Um, but I don't, I, I, in my experience, maybe you know different, but in my experience I have I've not seen it all the time. You know, there's some preachers that sounds like it's happening you know, every minute of the day. I've not seen that. Uh, but I, I, I don't doubt that Jesus Christ still heals people physically in their bodies. Uh, and in James it says, let the elders of the church come and pray for those who are sick. So yes, I think that that, that is the case. However, there is more than one kind of blindness, is there not? Just turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 2 Corinthians 4. Two Corinthians four and uh, verse three. The apostle Paul says, "But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world—he doesn't mean the living God; he he means uh, Satan. Okay, here the Bible is is giving him a title, God with a little g, in whom the God of this world." hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's a fantastic few verses, isn't it? The God of this world, the devil, has blinded the eyes of the mind, uh, blinded the eyes of the mind of this people. Those who reject the gospel, they are blind. They cannot see uh, the truth. So, such a significant. Uh, passage this but Christ 
Christ is anointed to bring that healing. He is anointed to bring sight to those who are blind, to restore so they can see. I mean, have you heard people become Christians and say, well, I see the truth now. You know, I can see God I can, and I can look back on my life and I can understand and I can read my Bible and suddenly it's like I've never read this book before. Maybe they've been a, Christ, uh, uh, been a religious person for many years and they, they were familiar with the Bible and then they become a Christian and they start to read it and they say, I've got a whole new understanding now. It's like God just opened my eyes. Well, that's what he did through Jesus Christ. I was blind and now I see. Somebody once wrote. Yeah, you, you get it. You can see. There, there is spiritual uh, uh, clarity of vision. But you know, just like the year of Jubilee started with that, oh, that horn blowing. And do you remember I, I connected it to Isaiah, uh, lift up your voice like a trumpet. What is the thing that is kicking all this off? What is the proclamation? This all starts with Jesus says it. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel. That's it. That's the horn crop. That's the, the trumpet sound. The gospel. It's absolutely no good thinking that the church can come and can help those who are broken hearted, those who are crushed and broken. Or think that, well, the church can, can come and, and, and bring deliverance to those who are, as it were, in chains. Or that the church can come and, and bring some kind of recovery of sight, even to the understanding of the things of God. Without the gospel, no chance. It's not going to happen. The gospel comes first. It has to be this good news of the kingdom. You know, you can run all the counselling courses that you like. And all the social action events, car washing, garden tidying, and so on. I'm not saying in a sense that there's anything wrong with helping people, doing things for them. James is very practical like that. Says, so, I mean, someone's cold or hungry, you know, you've got to do something about that. You don't just leave them. But it has to start with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the blast of the shofar, as far as I'm concerned. You know, uh, and, and, and the, the, the problem is in the church today, many of us, uh, say us, ma many people are, are very reticent about coming forth and sharing the gospel with others. They, they, they are concerned about it. But, but, you know, Spurgeon said, there should be no stutter, there should be no stammer when it comes to the gospel. He, he says, you know, well, there's nothing to be ashamed of when it comes to the gospel. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth. We ought not to be ashamed of this wonderful truth, because that is the blast of the shofar. That is a thing that, that gets God involved in people's lives and dealing with them and setting them free and doing all those wonderful things that we looked at there. But it doesn't come without the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will not come in your life either unless you heed the gospel. Well, why do people hold back? If, why do real Christians not want to share the gospel? Well, maybe, maybe you're thinking, well... The people in my family would get so upset if I started to talk about this gospel, started to talk about repentance and, and, and sin and faith in Christ. They wouldn't understand. They would, they would you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of hold that back there. But, but I want them to be healed. I want them to be healed from their brokenheartedness. I want them to be healed and, and delivered from their captivity. I want them to see the truth. Well, then you have no alternative. You must bring the gospel. Or maybe you think, well, you know, my career, I've got, I, I, I've got a, a name to consider here. You know, what about my name? I don't, I, if I start sharing the gospel, it might affect uh, 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 my career. Yeah, well, welcome to being a Christian. You know, my, my name is Mud. <laughs> in, uh, in, in many places in this town and, and, and has been introduced, and I'm not exaggerating, probably around the world now because of the internet and so on. 
but it goes with the territory. You're trying to protect your name and have a good name. Of course people will say things about you that aren't true. Of course people will run you down. Of course people will say he does this wrong, he does that wrong. If you're not prepared for that, you haven't truly counted the cost of following Jesus Christ. Paul said, uh, uh, if I wanted to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know, you've picked the wrong religion if you're, if you're hoping to maintain your good name and your good reputation. Forget it. You know, uh, uh, if they're going to lie about Christ and about the apostles, then they're going to lie about you as well. So if we want to see this blessing, this incredible uh, year of jubilee, this time of liberty that, that, that Christ has been anointed to bring in fulfillment of all that, it must involve the gospel. We cannot be shy about it anymore, about sharing the truth with our family, with our work colleagues, uh, with the man or woman in the street. Not because we get anything for it, but because we love them. Isn't, isn't that what Jesus said the, the most important two commandments were? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And to love your neighbour as yourself. If you don't share the only thing that has eternal consequences with your neighbour, do you really love them? Or I getting them a sandwich and putting a coat on them and, 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 and being nice to them. That's all good. Great. But if you don't tell them about what's going to happen to them unless they repent and believe in Jesus, then do you really love them? Will they thank you well, on the day of judgment when they stand looking over the edge into that abyss and you're stood in the line of the sheep and they're stood in the line of the goats and they look at you and you make that eye contact are they going to say thanks for going easy on me thank you for not upsetting me by telling me the gospel I don't think they'll be too thankful to you when they're heading into a Christless eternity in hell and I'm not going to apologise for putting it like that because that's what it is they are not going to thank you for that if they're going to get upset, they're going to get upset. But at least, come on, tell them the truth. Let them know. Do it in the most loving way you know, but tell them. Do you know Christ this morning? Do you know what it is to have that liberty, that freedom in Christ? Do you know what it is to... Have your broken heart healed by Jesus Christ, the one who was anointed to do just that. Do you see this morning? Do you have the sight that he promises? Do you see the truth? Have you heard the gospel, the sound of the gospel? Repent and believe. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation by grace through faith. Even this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Not by your good works. But by grace. By God's unmerited favour. Through faith are we saved. Have you heard that gospel? And if you have. Have you responded to it? That's all it takes. It's a response on your part. God has anointed Christ to do what is necessary. The Father ha ha has, has sent Christ into the world. The means are here. Okay? Uh, uh, the light has come and filled that dungeon. Now, are you going to stand up? Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to let him do what he has promised to do to regenerate you, to give you new life in Christ? That choice remains with you. God is not going to force that upon you, but he presents it to you this morning. If you haven't taken that up, let me encourage you this morning. There is nothing more to be done on your part other than repent and believe. That's it. I can't do any more than that. For you other than to tell you what God has said 
Repent and believe on Jesus Christ. Repent means to change your mind, to turn away. It also means to forsake sin, to leave it behind, and to believe on Jesus Christ. If you do that, God promises salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all your promises, Lord, for all your goodness to us. Just the overflow of mercy, Lord, is just incredible. And your grace to us, Lord, who could not and did not earn in any way this salvation that you offer. But I thank you so much, Lord, that you offer us not just salvation, but sanctification, a deep and holy work in the heart of mankind, Lord. And pray, Lord, that you would be with us for the rest of this day, Lord. That these thoughts would linger and would not go away, Lord. In Jesus' name.